trade associations in Washington, D.C. have a tendency of becoming all things to all people. And so when I was appointed, I flew around and met with members and non-members. What do you want your trade association to look like? And of course, job one is advocacy. I need you to the lobby. I need you to take care of us with the regulators and with Congress and the White House, but also need you to do compliance assistance and education and training. And so I kept hearing that over and over again. No one talked about marketing awards. No one talked about all this esoteric pixie dust stuff out there that all these trade associations do. So if it doesn't fall in one of those three buckets, advocacy, compliance assistance, or education and training, we don't do it anymore. So we stripped it all out and we focus on what we call the ACE, and that's advocacy, compliance, and education. is Associations Thrive, the podcast celebrating successful associations and their leaders. I'm your host, Joanna Pineda, CEO and Chief Troublemaker at Matrix Group International. Listen in as top association executives tell all, revealing the creative and innovative ways they're increasing membership, generating revenue, nurturing engagement, and reimagining their organizations. By the way, if you've launched a new initiative, created new member services, or updated your governance structure and are seeing great results, I want to hear your story and so do my listeners. I'd love to have you as a guest. Go to podcast.matrixgroup.net and apply to be on Associations Thrive. Now let's dive into this week's show. Today, I'm speaking with Dan Berger. He's president and CEO of the National Association of Federally Insured Credit Unions, or NAFQ. Hey, Dan, welcome to the show. Joanna, my pleasure. Thanks for having me. Hey, so tell us about NAFQ. Well, we are a trade association. We represent credit unions from all around the country, as well as Puerto Rico and Guam. We provide federal advocacy. We lobby the White House, Congress, Treasury, Federal Reserve, our prudential regulator, the NCUA as well as provide compliance assistance and education and training. We were founded in 1967 by a group of credit unions out in California that wanted better representation in Washington, D.C. And here we are 50-something years later and growing. And so it's going really, really well. So it's great to share some time with you today. Dan, for my listeners who don't really know what a credit union is or what a federally insured credit union is, how are they different from banks? We are not-for-profit financial institutions, and so we don't have the financial pressures that banks have with their stocks and shareholders. We don't have 24-year-old analysts on Wall Street dealing with those pressures on a quarterly basis, so they can do some long-term planning. We are democratically controlled. It's one member, one vote. The members own the institution. Ah. There's not a profit motive there. Of course, you have to have revenue to keep the lights on and provide salaries and low-interest loans and higher interest on your savings. But overall, being not-for-profit financial institutions makes it a more conservatively run institution. So Dan, I know that you as an organization believe that every American should belong to a credit union. What services can I get from a credit union that I would normally think to get from a bank? Personal loans, credit cards, auto loans, mortgages, wealth management services. They have the entire financial services litany across the board just have to find the right credit union to do it. But we provide all the same products and services that any bank would do. So the message today is join a credit union. Absolutely. Join the other 135 million American consumers that are already members of a credit union. Hey, Dan, you're in the financial services industry, and the news is covering nonstop the demise of Silicon Valley Bank. So how did that happen? And could it happen to a credit union? I don't think it can happen to a credit union, but Silicon Valley Bank, something was really missed. They were cited in 2019, 2020, and I believe 2021 for having too many uninsured assets. Credit unions, 90, 91% of all the assets in credit unions are insured. And that's you know insured below the $250,000 insurance level, the same with FDIC. We have NCOA insurance backed by the government, just like banks do through our prudential regulator backed by the U.S. government. And so we have the vast majority of your assets who are insured, you're protected. 
with SVB, 97% of their assets were uninsured. Ooh. So the concentration risk was tremendous. It was unbelievable. And they knew that. They quadrupled their uninsured assets in four years. And so there were red flags everywhere that was going on. So if you can have a basic understanding of financials, look at their balance sheet or, or their financials, you would have seen this concentration risk on their balance sheet. It was problematic for a long time. And how it got missed is being looked at. Congress is looking at it. The Federal Reserve is looking at it. But the red flags were there. But it was clearly missed. Wow. So the auditors were sleeping on the job because they're supposed to make sure that doesn't happen. Yeah. The examiners, they found it. They were cited saying, hey, there's some concentration risk. You don't have a risk manager, a chief risk officer. I mean, there's all these red flags and, and they didn't mitigate any of this. So those are some of the things we're going to deep dive and find out what really occurred there. Dan, I was on your blog and you've got an article about preparing for a possible downturn. I think the blog said something like, the signs are pointing to some kind of a downturn, even though we're not sure it's going to be a full-on recession. So how are you helping your members prepare for that? And how are they preparing for a possible downturn? Yeah, we track this. We have a chief economist on staff and we have a research division here at NAFQ. We track all that. We, we track the litany of financial indicators in multiple industries, banking, credit unions, insurance across the board. And so we try to give them a peek of what's coming and try to give them a heads up. And we monitor this all closely. And it's information. We give them timely information, call report information from the various regulators and how their institutions are doing. And so we have a litany of stuff that our chief economist puts together. And this information helps the CFO, the CEO, and the credit union be prepared for anything that's coming around the corner. Amazing. Hey, so before we talk about the things that NAFQ is doing to thrive, let's talk about your journey. So how did you get to be president and CEO of NAFQ? Well, I came to D.C. to be chief of staff for a congresswoman from Florida and did that for about a year and then left and lobbied for the community banks for seven, eight years. And then a executive recruiter, Corn Ferry, came and said, hey, would you like to go lobby for another association? I said, yeah, I'd be glad to listen. I went from, you know, I missed managing of people as a chief of staff because you had two dozen folks. I had two district offices, a D.C. office, and I liked managing all those moving parts. And when I was at the community bankers, I oversaw three or four lobbyists, and that was it. But here was an opportunity to be the BVP of Government Affairs at the National Trade Association, overseeing five divisions in three dozen people. And so that was really exciting to me. It was more responsibility. It was always in the back of my mind to, to try to become a president and CEO of a trade association. Because for me, it's that perfect convergence of business and politics and policy. It's sickening as it sounds to some people, but it's three-dimensional chess. And I love all that. You have the business aspects. I got the politics. You know, I got the policy aspects. And to do it for an industry like credit unions, we are the white hats in financial services. Ah. So to do it for credit unions, it was a blessing, terrific opportunity. So Dan, I have many clients who started out as lobbyists or became lobbyists and then took the chief executive job. That's a completely different role, though. So how do you prepare yourself for that? That's a great question. I had been here at NAFQ for seven years always in the back of my mind and, and mentioned by Corn Ferry and others that the possibility of being appointed CEO when my predecessor retired. But there's so much going on that I was like, hey, I got some blind spots. I understood the business. I had been here. I understood the financials and our balance sheets. And of course, I knew the people and the issues that we dealt with. So I got an executive coach. Ah, John Spence does a wonderful job. He actually speaks still to this day at our Management and Leadership Institute where we train young, growing leaders within our industry. He really was helpful to me as well as to NAFQ in getting to the next stage and really helped me with the communication. When you think you're communicating, you got to do it like 19 more times. Yes. I think they're listening, but they got a lot going on in their lives, families and pressures and all this stuff going, kids and athletic events and whatever it is. And he said, you got to communicate more. You have to communicate, communicate, communicate. And so having an executive coach was extremely, extremely helpful. But with that, I also had a cabal of other CEOs, four or five other CEOs that were my sounding board. 
But when I was appointed CEO, not only had an executive coach, I had a sounding board of CEOs that I would speak to. There were also in trade associations, not in financial services, but in different industries. And they were extremely helpful. They had seen it all. Dan, how did you create this community of other association CEOs? Did you just reach out to them? You created your own network. Some of them I knew, you know, in passing in Washington, D.C., and some I just reached out, called or sent an email, said, hey, can I buy you a cup of coffee? Can I buy you a glass of wine? I'd like to chat and talk to you about this stuff because you've been doing it for a while and I just got appointed. I'd like to learn more. And the, the one that they helped me the most with was like board governance and board relationships and how to develop and maintain that because it's so crucial to have a professional working relationship with your board. They were extremely helpful with that. I learned a tremendous amount of that dynamic because my predecessor dealt with all that. And I, that's one element of NAFCA that I didn't see a lot of. So that was one of my blind spots that I had to work on. Amazing. So, hey, let's talk about the things that NAFQ is doing to thrive. And thriving you are. Dan, you say that when you came to NAFQ, you wanted to kind of strip down what you did to three things to make it clear to the members what you do and what your value is. So talk to us about how you came to that conclusion and how you did it. Yeah, as you're well aware, and you see it across the association spectrum, trade associations in Washington, D.C. have a tendency of becoming all things to all people. And so when I was appointed, I flew around and met with members and non-members. What do you want your trade association to look like? And of course, job one is advocacy. I need you to the lobby. I need you to take care of us with the regulators and with Congress and the White House, but also need you to do compliance assistance and education and training. And so I kept hearing that over and over again. No one talked about marketing awards. No one talked about all this esoteric pixie dust stuff out there that all these trade associations do. So if it doesn't fall in one of those three buckets, advocacy, compliance assistance, or education and training, we don't do it anymore. So we stripped it all out and we focus on what we call the ACE, and that's advocacy, compliance, and education. So over time, you retired some products and services. And that's hard to do in an association. How'd you do that? We just did it. <laughs> you just did it? Awesome. <laughs> yeah, it was one of those, you had to justify, was the juice worth the squeeze? What's the ROI? And as an economist by education, I'm a numbers guy. And it's a, from a cost accounting standpoint, we were spending you know, a quarter million dollars of staff time running these marketing awards and getting about eight grand out of it. Yeah, it's a feel-good trade associations do it. And I understand we just don't do it anymore. It didn't make any sense. It wasn't core to what we were focused on. And so we did have some staff that were like, hey, we've always done it. And people were allowed to say that to me one time. We've always done it. And I said, well, if you can't justify it, besides the fact that we've always done it, then it's going to go away. And we had meetings. We talked about it. It wasn't me just ordering it to get it done. I had a tremendous amount of input from my colleagues throughout the building, but we've stripped it down. If it didn't fall in those three buckets, we just don't do it anymore. Wow. Talk about focus and discipline. But to your point, so there are some legacy, especially for the folks that have been here for 15, 20 years, there are some legacy programs and it was really difficult to get rid of some of them. They were kicking and screaming, we've always done it this way. We've always done this. We've done X, Y, and Z. And it just, it's not our focus. It's not what our members want. I know it's what you want, but it's not what our members want. And so we're going to focus on our membership. Hey, so you say that a key secret weapon for you at NAFQ is your staff, and that hiring is really important and culture. So talk to us about that, because that's really great that as a CEO, you're spending time on the staff and the culture. I believe 100% staff is everything. If you walk into our headquarters, we have a sign on the wall and says our staff is our most valuable asset, and we believe it. And you can't just say it. Yes. You have to prove it to your staff. Yes. So we revamped all that. We provide education and training for staff. We, we provide 100% health care for staff. We rejiggered the compensation program here, modeled after Southwest Airlines and FedEx, where the association does well. We give it back to the employees in form of bonuses at the end of the year. All that was done intentionally to take care of staff. So you take care of staff. In turn, they do a wonderful job of taking care of your members. Right. And then so far, it's worked. We focus on culture every single day. I believe in the 80-20 rule. So I think 80% we're getting right, and it's probably 20% we can always continue to work on. And that's the focus that we try to focus on every day is trying to reduce that 20%. 
So every time you get it, you have better attraction for employees, you have better retention of employees. And so we focus a lot on culture and staffing. You have this interesting requirement that we talked about during the prep where you like to hire people who have been on teams. Yep. Tell us about that. That's fascinating. I've heard this from other organizations and we do too, but I want to hear about it from you. Yeah, Joanna, we have what we call a hiring matrix here. If you're in high school or college, we wanted you to be on, an, on a team, whether it's a dance team, an athletic team, marching band, theater. And if you, if you needed to work in school, then you had to work at McDonald's or Burger King on a team. So where your individual performance affects the entire organization or the entire team, and it's work. Every time that we've deviated from that, it's kind of bit us in the rear. And so we really try to focus on the hiring matrix and focusing on getting those folks with the right attitude and aptitude in the door. Boy, that's really good advice, because then those are folks that you don't have to train to be on a team because they've already got the mindset. That's exactly right. We focus heavily on our values. If you want excellence, you want passion, you want people to be member driven, which are our three values, you want people that have been on teams and they understand that. If you're on a team, your coach demanded excellence, your coach demanded passion, your coach demanded that you're a player driven or you're focused on your, your fellow colleagues on the team. That kind of stuff matters. It's really, really important for an organization to have those core values and to really take care of each other. And it just works. I mean, if you have folks that are team oriented, it really works. And, and now I'm not talking about you have to be extrovert versus introvert. Two thirds of my staff are introvert. We do Myers Briggs testing. I think two thirds of my staff are introverts. They're the best. They're awesome. Yeah. That attitude and that aptitude is really key. And that hiring matrix has really worked well for us. Love it. Dan, you say that governance is, you know, key to the success of any organization. And you made a change in 2014 to the eligibility rules for the organization, and that's fueled your growth. So tell us about that, because that's really interesting. Yeah, we used to represent just federal credit unions, federally chartered credit unions that are insured by and, and overseen by our credential regulator, the NCOA. And then in 2014, we opened up to state chartered credit unions that are overseen by their state regulator. And we did it for two reasons. Number one was the state chartered CEOs were contacting my board of directors going, hey, we want your compliance assistance that you're doing for Dodd-Frank and Humda and all these issues that came out of that Dodd-Frank legislation and all these rules that are being promulgated. Everybody sees the excellence, but I can't join. Ah. And so things roll downhill fast from the board of directors to the CEO. He said, how can we help these other CEOs? And I said, well, you have to change our field of membership requirements and have a, not only a board vote, a membership vote. So what happened was we had almost near unanimous people in the mid-90s voting to allow state charters in to our field of membership. But I also saw that it was also a, an increasing of the marketplace for NAFQ and for new members to come in. And we've had extraordinary growth. It's been absolutely awesome. So previously, was there no home for these state chartered credit unions? No, nope, there's a competing association called CUNA that's here. So now we compete with them toe to toe. But we've had extraordinary growth because our focus is so strong. And hence the change of the name from National Association of Federal Credit Unions to Federally Insured Credit Unions. That's correct. So the acronym didn't have to change. Good job. <laughs> <laughs> you also made a change to your executive conference that kind of mirrors the change in governance. Yeah, we used to have a CEO's conference and it was just CEOs of credit unions. And we we're like, how can we get more people to attend? Number one. But number two, a lot of the CEOs were in transition going, hey, I'm about to retire I would like my number two to come with me, whether it's a CFO or COO, but they can't. They're not a credit union CEO. So we made the change to call it the CEO and senior executives conference. And it just took off like gangbusters because of that change. And so there was a member need and a marketplace need from the AFCU standpoint. And it was one of those twofers that, that we got in expanding the, just the title and the attendees that are allowed to attend the conference. Wow, that's absolutely brilliant. What you're doing is you're cultivating the next generation of leaders, which is amazing for membership and retention, but you're also responding to a big need and probably generating revenue as a result. 
Yes. We generate revenue. When the attendees sign up, that's always a good thing to keep from dealing with hotel attrition and everything else. Hey, how did you fare during the pandemic? Did you make changes to some of your offerings or how you delivered your offerings? We actually handled the pandemic pretty darn well. And if you recall, and I guess it's 06 or 07, we had that huge snowstorm here in the D.C. area. Yes. Four or five feet. Everything shut down, including NAFQ. And like, we can't operate that. And so it wasn't being prescient for a pandemic, but we gave everybody laptops. And so when we shut down Friday, March 16th of 2020, we were up and running in two hours. Nice. Everybody had laptops. No one knew that we had shut down. People were still calling and getting the assistance they need, especially from a compliance standpoint. We were still lobbying and dealing with Congress and the regulators with everything that was going on with COVID. And so we didn't miss a beat. But the other thing that we did, they still need to be educated. And so we saw that they needed to have their education, the continuing education, especially in the compliance realm, the compliance education. So we rented a studio in D.C. and it was something like fifteen, twenty thousand dollars $20,000 a day to rent it. And I was like, God, I'm spending a hundred grand to rent this place for a week. Yeah. Why don't I just build one? Ah. So I went to the board and it said, Hey, I, I need 850 grand to build a studio. So we built a, a studio here at headquarters to be able to push out content and to continue to inform members and educate our members. It looks like CNBC or ESPN. I mean, control room. I mean, it's absolutely beautiful. We use it just about every day. I was in it all morning this morning, videotaping some segments. But we use it almost a daily basis. People rent it from us. Other associations are coming and they rent our studio in order to push stuff out. And we also let groups do in-kind. Habitat for Humanity, Defense Credit Union Council uses it. And we do it probably just an in-kind donation to those organizations. Dan, what kind of products are you producing in the studio? Mostly education. We'll do advocacy and lobbying updates. Here's what this new rule has got promulgated. This is what you need to know about this rule or here's a, an update about what's going on in Congress. But a lot of it is education-based. A lot of it is compliance schools and things like that. Because everything's going to be hybrid right? going forward. You're going to have in-person conferences, and you're going to have a digital component. And that's how we deliver on both. And we have both now. We do conferences in person, as well as we create content in the studio. And you've got a podcast called The Cup, and it's a video podcast. Yeah, that's Our VP of Regulatory Affairs, she does that and does a wonderful job. And she has some pretty darn high profile folks come sit in that video podcast room. We got a sofa. She does an extraordinarily good job with it and has wonderful guests. I haven't even been on it yet. What? Well, I haven't even been on it yet, but she does a (laughs) wonderful job. It's tremendous. And NAFQ Services, which is our for profit subsidiary, also has podcasts and they do a great job over there as well. Wow. I watched a couple of the Cup episodes and they're wonderful. I think you are absolutely right when you say it's like CNN quality. Yeah. Wow. So we hear a lot about how associations kind of survive the pandemic by really focusing on communities. And you've got communities. Talk to us about how they fared during the pandemic and how important are they? We started creating what we call networks that are out there. And so during the pandemic, we found out People were looking for communities to ask questions. How are you dealing with this? How are you dealing with that? And we like to have a confidential forum where we can ask questions in person or anonymously to get through some of these things that they were experiencing during the pandemic. So we have several networks. We have a CEO network, CFO network, a compliance risk and BSA network. We have a cybersecurity and IT network. HR network, lending network, and the marketing and growth network. And so everybody wanted their own little fiefdom to have discussions about the issue of the day and seek help because you're not the only person experienced something like this. And maybe someone's already been through it and can help coach you and guide you with their experiences, things to do, but more importantly, things not to do maybe. So these are online networks. Are they in person as well? Some do have an in-person component, like the CFO's network has an in-person component. The CEO network has, of course, a CEO and senior executive conference. And the others will will potentially have conferences surrounding them as well. So what you're creating within NAFQ is this is your home for the organization, but this is also your home for the specific roles within the credit unions. That's absolutely correct. If you have certain duties and responsibilities, we try to create networks 
that's been asked for, quite frankly, we're being responsive. You know, in an HR network, that just came out of the blue. A lot of the HR folks were going, hey, we're getting stuff from SHRM and some other trade associations that deal with human resources, but I need something that applies to credit unions. We're just a little bit of a different beast it's not for profit. Wow. And so it's a little more customized for the credit unit industry. So, Dan, how's membership? Membership's awesome. Yay. It's going really, really well. It's that hockey stick that everybody likes to take a look at. We're doing quite well. So really proud of my colleagues. The reason they did it. The members join, but it's our colleagues that show the value. Our value proposition held up extremely well during the pandemic. And we were prepared to make some substantial changes. If we hit some major headwinds. We had all kinds of levers to pull to deal with it. We've had our best three years in the last three years, and it's just been extraordinary. I bet the focus on ACE, advocacy, compliance, and education, and really doubling down on it during the pandemic and making it very clear what your value proposition has really helped you sail through the pandemic. I'll tell you what, the marketing team, the communications team in here at NAFCA are just absolutely crackerjack. They did a great job getting that information out, and this is our focus, and we say it everywhere, and we print it everywhere, and we blinking lights around it. You'll find it everywhere. But the ACEs, I think, is key to the focus. And we live it too, though. If it doesn't fall in one of those three buckets, we just don't do it anymore. Amazing. So you've got something on your website that I want to highlight to the listeners. It's called your 2022 accomplishments. It's actually a main menu navigation item on the website. I haven't seen that before. And it is brilliant because you're basically saying to the world and to the membership, this is what we've done. This is what we've accomplished in 2022. And you go to a beautiful page that lists the accomplishments. So if you're a member with any doubts about what this organization is doing for you, it's right there. I'll link to it in the show notes. Man, absolutely brilliant, Dan. Yeah, we've always had an accomplishments brochure, and it was really started by our VP of membership, Catherine Porterfield. And our marketing people spiced it up a little bit and make it appealing from an optic point of view. Yeah, it lists everything that we've accomplished, most of the key elements that we have accomplished. But yeah, we're really proud of it. And they work hard. I like my colleagues boasting about their accomplishments. It's good. Hey, so what do we have to look forward to from NAFQ in 2023 and 2024? More of the same. We continue to focus on the ACE. Advocacy is job one. 99% of people join trade associations for the advocacy and for the lobbying for their respective industries. And it's no different than for NAFCU and the credit union industry. So we're going to continue to focus on government, Congress, the prudential regulators, things that Treasury and the White House are doing, and CFPB, the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau, and other areas. We're going to continue to advocate. And then second tier, of course, is to continue to provide the compliance assistance, as well as the education and training that the membership requires. Dan, I want to thank you so much for sharing what you've been doing and all the things that are contributing to your success. And I hope you'll come back and report back on everything that you're doing. Joanna, my pleasure. Thanks so much for the opportunity. Thanks for listening to Associations Thrive. We're so glad to have you here. You know, my personal mission and the mission of my company, Matrix Group International, is to help associations and nonprofits increase membership, generate revenue, and thrive in the digital space. I want to hear stories of how your organization is thriving in today's challenging landscape. Please apply to be on my show by going to podcast.matrixgroup.net. By the way, do you need help with a digital initiative? Maybe it's a website redesign, a new membership database, or a hybrid meeting that you're planning. I'd love to connect with you please visit the Matrix Group website at matrixgroup.net. Thanks again for listening to this week's episode of Associations Thrive. Don't forget to subscribe to the show, leave a five-star rating, post a comment, and share it with your colleagues and friends. Bye!